Today's story is particularly interesting and uh, for those who believe in destiny, listen to this one. These are true tales of my African adventures. May this inspire you, deter you, caution you, and above all, entertain you. So the title of the story is Perfect Irony or Destiny Deferred. Can one interfere with destiny? Can destiny be delayed? It seems that even in the animal kingdom, let alone amongst us humans, destiny weaves its inevitable web. Having purchased our farm in the Waterberg biosphere in 2003, I noticed an absence of pythons on the farm and in the district in general. Having spoken to the farmer who had sold us our farm and other farmers in the district, as well as speaking to farmhands, we discovered that over the years pythons had been killed in numbers to prevent them from taking calves and valuable game. Pythons were nowhere to be found. To remedy this, I obtained permits, constructed a large, beautiful natural enclosure and introduced good-sized female pythons with a suitable mate. African rock pythons are the largest snake species in southern Africa. They have been known to reach five meters and considerably more than that. I know big pythons used to abound in this district. Some 35 years before the purchase of our farm, I had been on a capturing expedition near Ellis Russ with colleagues when we drove onto a farm hoping to seek permission to scout the banks of the Mogol River and thus to look for mambas, pythons and cobras the following morning. There we met with an extremely friendly farmer who, with the usual bushveld hospitality, invited us in for coffee and sandwiches where he entertained our request with bemusement. During our conversation, he had indicated that some 15 years earlier, they had killed a large python, the biggest he had seen, and he had kept the skin. Curious, we inquired as to the size of the creature. Oh, around 22 feet, he exclaimed. We were used to these stories of gigantic reptiles and discounted them, usually, like in old fishermen's tales, the snake had grown in the mind of the storyteller and reached proportions way beyond the actual size. We humoured him, indicating that it must have been a record for the district. Before we could move on to the next topic, he suddenly blurted out, Would you like to see the skin? Now this was most unusual. He had indicated the size of the snake and was now prepared to come up with the goods. Most certainly, we exclaimed realizing that we were possibly about to be treated to something quite extraordinary. We followed him across the lawn to a storeroom next to his parking garage. We all waited anxiously on the lawn as he unlocked the steel door and disappeared into the gloomy storeroom. Presently he emerged carrying a large object shaped like a 44 gallon drum, clutching it to his chest with arms outstretched around the object and with his hands not quite meeting in the middle. I figured in the failing light that he was indeed carrying a 44 gallon drum into which he had stuffed the snakeskin. <clears throat> As he drew closer, I noticed patterning on the object. My jaw dropped as I realized that the object was not a drum but the skin itself. He placed it on the lawn, then laying it on the grass, began to roll it out, asking me to pin the tail section down. None of us could believe what we were looking at. The skin was roughly 1.2 meters wide. I asked one of my colleagues to pace out the skin, and indeed, it was 21 feet. Snake skins can be stretched in the length and the width once the snake skin has been removed from the dead snake. But even so, this was the largest python I had seen and my only regret was that I did not photograph and measure correctly and record its size, as I have never heard of such a big snake. We had captured pythons of 15 and a half feet and larger on occasion. 
These were very big, powerful animals capable of swallowing small antelope and calves. They have been known to kill people on numerous occasions and indeed there are photographs of them having swallowed people. This giant could have been 25 or 30 years old or even a lot more and would have grown to this admirable size in pristine bush felt where it would have lived undisturbed until 1953 when it met its death at the hands of the farmer. Our female python was intended for breeding so that we could release its progeny in the district, thereby once again bringing a healthy population of pythons to the bushveld on our farm and surrounding areas. This would help restore the balance of what we felt was necessary biodiversity in this region. For a python of some 4.9 to 5.2 meters, the approximate size of our female, to feed on small prey such as chickens would be rather like a human adult eating a handful of peas. So we put out the word to farmers that any dead calves and the like would be welcome once in a while. We received word that a goat farmer in the district slaughtered his excess male goats as he was a goat milk farmer and had no use for the males. We approached the farmer and offered to pay him a small fee for young slaughtered goats once per month. As it turned out, he was not such a callous man and although he had to slaughter some of them, he did also give them away live. Well, on this occasion, he thrust two young goats upon us, still very much alive and kicking. Instead of both being males, one was indeed a female. As it turned out, he had too many goats and was now offloading males and females. The little goats were bundled into the back of the truck and off we traveled to our farm some distance away. I had softened in my maturing years and on arriving at our farm took one look at the delightful pair of bleating kids and immediately realized I was not going to be able to present them to the python. I was afraid the python was going to have to get used to chicken and that was that. Dawn, my wife, instantly fell in love with the goats. Within a day, they were part of the family. They were named Jack and Jill and needed to be bottle fed twice a day, which was quite a performance. An hour before feeding time, they would call us incessantly until either Dawn or I arrived with two one litre bottles filled with warm milk. They latched onto the giant teats on the bottles and hungrily devoured the milk. They would then follow all and sundry around the farm playing King of the Castle. Every time they passed a rocky outcrop, the one playfully butting the other off the highest point. This is one of the reasons they were called Jack and Jill, because they were always going up the hill. If perchance they managed to nip into the farmhouse, they would climb the couches, chairs and dining table, managing to wreck everything in sight within seconds. They thought nothing of urinating on the furniture and leaving an unimaginable smell in their wake as they were tackled and removed. We became very fond of these goats and they were now our kids, a part of the family. Well, this family affair went on for six months until they were weaned. They then joined our small herd of Kalahari red goats and were free to roam the farm grazing with the Kalahari reds. These milk goats were pure white and the Kalahari reds often victimized them, seemingly not approving of their pure white coats. Presently the goats all became friends and all was well in the goat camp. So Python was doing well on chicken and nearing her first breeding season. Jack and Jill, although visiting us from time to time during the day, whiled away their time eating all they could with the Kalahari Reds, and so life settled down in this manner. We have a wetland area of some 25 hectares on the farm, with a river and a large swampy area. Some areas are most impenetrable, 
In time, the goats found the lush vegetation in the flay irresistible. And so at least a portion of the day was spent in the swamps, out of sight and out of mind. It is hard to forget the following events. Two of our trusted farm hands placed delectable goat pellets into the goat's kraal each afternoon before dusk to lure them into safety, safe from the leopards and hyenas which had preyed on our goats over the preceding months before knocking off for the day. At around 5 p.m. there was a knock on the door. Our staff indicated that Jill had not returned from her foraging in the flay. Well, I said, go back and look for her. You know where she is likely to be, and do so before dark, before the leopards and the hyenas find her. I settled down to some paperwork when presently there was a frantic knock at the door. There I met our farm hands. What they had to say left me rooted to the spot. They had penetrated a section of dense reeds near the river. There was a large python which had succeeded in securing Jill by the snout in its large jaws. All 120 teeth in the python's jaws were sunk into her with several coils constricting her young body. <clears throat> I immediately instructed them to run back to the flay as fast as they could. I must say at this point that our farm hands had been trained to capture all species of snakes that occurred on the farm. We tried to discourage them from catching black mambas, although they persisted and caught them from time to time. As they hightailed it back to the flay, I shouted after them with as much authority as I could muster, save the goat, catch the python, and bring them both back. I could have gone with them, but alas, instinctively, I already knew the outcome. I decided rather to prepare dawn for the inevitable. Some 50 minutes later there was a more subdued knock at the door. Dawn was sitting on a couch in the lounge awaiting the news. I opened the door and there they stood at the threshold holding the limp body of Jill, her life constricted out of her by the python. There was blood still dripping from the multiple tooth punctures on her face. Where is the python? I shouted. It got away, they retorted, slipping into the river before we could secure a proper hold on it. Dawn was clearly mortified, but quiet, bless her. I stood for a while taking in the events, then instructed the men to bury the goat immediately in a place where I would later plant a small tree. After dismissing the men, I sat down with Dawn, poured us each a glass of red wine, and reflected on the irony of the events. Here was a dear little goat, which should have been slaughtered at birth. We intervened by purchasing her, intended as a meal for our captive breeding female pythons. The life of the doomed goat was elevated to a more noble status as it became part of the family. It seems nature's intention was greater and more powerful than ours and that she was to become the victim of a python, despite our change of heart and our greatest efforts. Such perfect irony, I thought, a destiny deferred.